Am I wrong for giving my daughter's vegan friend meaty? <laughs> Sorry. Do it again. Wait. Okay, Bismo. Am I wrong for giving my daughter's vegan friend meaty meals during sleepovers? My daughter and her friend M are both 12 years old and like to have sleepovers every now and then. M's family maintains a strict vegan diet where she isn't even allowed to drink milk. That's what that's what fucking veganism is. Yeah, okay. Her parents are nice people, although a bit on the neurotic side. So whenever she's over, I always make a big meaty meal for them. Last weekend, I made some cheeseburgers and steak for them on the grill with a big glass of milk. M absolutely loves it and always politely asks for more, which I happily provide. M is a bright young girl and she's a good friend to my daughter, but I notice how much smaller and paler she is compared to my daughter. I think it's likely tied to her family's diet. Not for you to decide. For snacks, I give them some of my Venetian turkey. For breakfast, I typically make a big plate of scrambled eggs and bacon, again with a big glass of milk. Despite her size, M always wolfs down whatever I make. And I have to say, every time she leaves, it looks like she has a healthy glow to her. What? I know I probably shouldn't be doing this, but I think M is a bit malnourished. Nothing against vegans or anything. She knows she'll get in big trouble if she tells her folks. I think she fibs a bit to her parents about what she eats here. So it got me thinking, am I wrong for letting my daughter's vegan friend eat meat at my house? Fam, like, some of these things, like, you can't, you can't. I'll give you this. You had good intentions. That's it. I am the eldest of three sisters, 23, 19, and 17. My youngest sister's boyfriend has made these really weird eyes at me before and has said flirty things, which I've always ignored and told her about. She would just go, LOL, that's just how he is. He doesn't mean anything by it. That's trifling as hell because you are my baby sister's boyfriend and it's gross AF for so many other reasons. Last night, my middle sister came to my apartment just to hang out. One minute, we were watching Netflix and drinking wine, and the next minute, she's breaking down crying, confessing that over her winter break, she slept with our younger sister's boyfriend. I was so shocked, the ability of speech failed me in that moment. I just sat there flabbergasted as she gave me the entire four-week account of this fling that she had with him. She had just gotten out of a longish-term relationship herself and was heartbroken. According to her, he was around and down for whatever. When she was done, I asked her why she was telling me this, and she said that she hoped I'd be able to tell her what to do. I told her this is going to crush our sister because she has always talked about being the ugly little sister and being stuck in our shadows, which couldn't be farther from the truth. She really plays a lot of her self-worth and value in this relationship and she will be devastated. I think she deserves to know, so I told her that you need to tell her ASAP or I will. She said that it wasn't my place and I told her, you included me in this. I was perfectly content to watch Grey's Anatomy and cry my eyes out and then you turned my apartment into a confessional. After I took her home, I wondered if there was a better way to approach this that wasn't so confrontational. I am open to suggestions, particularly those that will not destroy my sister's relationship because I take absolutely no joy in being the bearer of shitty news. Story time on why I tried to run over my science teacher because he was a pervert. So back in 2015, I went to a university, which I'm not going to say the name of because I don't want them to know that I'm talking about them. And I majored in nursing. And usually when you major in that type of field, you usually get a lot of like science classes. So my first year, I took chemistry, which all the students have to do for their first year. It was a requirement. And my science teacher, we're going to call him Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson was like, like in his 40s, middle age. He had a wife and two sons. I know this because he plastered them all over the damn desk. His class was hard, but he was a really nice teacher. And whenever I needed any help, I could email him. I could come to his classroom after school hours. This went on for the whole year. So one day, I leave his class really late. He offers me a ride back home to my apartment. And of course, I said yes. This is when it gets us. Come back for part two. This is part two of why I tried to run over my science teacher because he was a pervert. So, like I said earlier, I left his class late. It was really dark, and he asked if I needed a ride home to my apartment. And, you know, of course, I said yes, because I thought it might be safer for me to get a ride from him than for me to be walking late in the dark at night. So, I give him directions on where to go. He'd ask me questions about things outside of school, and I thought it was nice because it seemed like he genuinely cared. Halfway there, he tells me that he's hungry, and if I minded if he parked to the side so he could order food for his house. He ordered his food and then just sat there. And I was like, so are we going to go? Then literally, I don't know where this man starts bawling. I felt awkward, but I asked him what was wrong. He starts talking about his family and his wife and divorce. Thought it was weird, but you know, I tried to console him. Then he looks at me, starts rubbing my knees and says, this is why I adore you. It gets crazier. I'm running out of time. This is part three of why I tried to run over my science teacher because he was a pervert. If you didn't watch part one and part two, go ahead and watch it because I'm about to just go straight in. 
So he grabs my face and literally, literally tries to kiss me. I was like, what the heck are you doing? He was like, come on now. I know why you came. In my head, I'm like, hmm. And he's like, look, just do me this one favor and I give you an A in my class. And I was like, nope, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. And he yanks me back closer to him. And guys, I don't know what it is, but I got this like body trigger. Like the moment someone touches me, I'm throwing hands. And I'm messing up Mr. Jackson so bad that he had to hop out of his car. And at that moment, I just saw red. When he got out, I closed and locked his doors. He was yelling at me to get out. By the way, guys, I cannot drive. But that day, I just decided to drive. And I swerved, almost crashing the car, trying to run over him. He runs off and runs into the bushes somewhere. From there, I hopped out. This is why you should never have two best friends, but instead, one friend. Be careful of being the third wheel. When I was in high school, I had two best friends, Naomi and Cassandra. One Saturday night, we went to a party. When we went back home, we didn't have rides back home. Also, by the way, when we were in the party, Cassandra met this guy. When we stood outside the party looking for a way to get home, the guy Cassandra had talked to earlier had pulled up in his car. And he asked her if she needed a ride. She, of course, asked if he could take me and Naomi home. He said yes, but he only had room for one more person, and he told her to choose. And she chose Naomi. And in that moment, I really realized who were really the best friends. I asked him to please not leave me there alone. So Cassandra asked the guy if he could come back for me and pick me up. And being the good guy that he was, he said yes. But when they left, he never came back for me. The three best friend trio. Last year, I went on a girl's trip with my friends. It was fun, but toward the end, we had to pack up and leave. So while all the girls were packing up, me and one of my other friends went downstairs to the front desk to give the key card. When we went down there, the lobby was packed with a bunch of girls, and I'm guessing it was for a ladies' retreat. So the line was extremely long, and there was this really pretty lady that skipped the whole line, but no one noticed. So I assumed that she skipped because she was with the other girls in the retreat. She got her key card and got her room. Fast forward, after we give up our key cards to the front desk, we went back to our room to pack. 15 minutes later, we get a loud knock on the door, and it's the police. I opened the door, and he asked me and my friends, have we seen this girl anywhere? And it was a girl with a popsicle stick, and immediately I said no. One of my roommates said, oh, she's really pretty. And then I said, wait a minute, that was the same girl that had skipped the line. The police told us to stay in our room until further notice because that same girl went to her husband's hotel. She cut off his pee-pee, then pushed his mistress over the balcony. And now she's running through the hotel. Story time on how my own best friend set me up. Trigger warning, sexual assault. So when I was 13, 14 in the eighth grade, I met this girl, which we're going to call Aubrey. Throughout that year, we became really close friends. And we even went to each other's houses just about every day. And at that time, I was a virgin. I was very insecure and I didn't know my worth. And definitely attracted to the wrong boys. And that's how me and Aubrey related. We bonded over trauma. Which can be toxic. But anyways, one day we met these boys. At that time, I didn't know who these boys were. And Aubrey pretended not to know them either. But I had no idea. They had to be like 17, 18. But I actually really don't know. Because they probably lied about their age anyway. So we started hanging around these boys. Which we're going to call Stick and George. And at that time, I really liked George. Throughout our weeks of hanging out, they asked if I ever smoked Mary Jane. And I said no, because I've never smoked. Push come to shove, I get peer pressured into doing it. And I think it was laced. Come back for part two. This is part two of how my own best friend set me up. Trigger warning, sexual assault. So like I said earlier, I got peer pressured into smoking Mary Jane. And I think it was laced. Throughout that time of being intoxicated, I didn't know what was really going on. And remember the guy I told you guys about, George? Well, he had his way with me and my friend. Aubrey knew about it, but didn't say anything. I didn't realize the severity of the situation and definitely didn't agree to anything that happened. As time went on, I started to gain my memory back on what was actually going on and started to understand. And I decided to tell my family but nothing happened. It was almost like the person who did it to me got a slap on the wrist for what he did. Story time on why my dad would never allow me and my sister inside of his basement. So growing up, my parents split and my sister and I would stay with my mom. During the summer, we'd go see our father. My dad was a mortician and he owned a funeral home. When he would do his work, he'd go to his basement and tell us to never go inside of it. 
At night, he locked his basement. I always assumed that he didn't want to go in down there in fear of us seeing dead bodies. One night, me and my sister was up. We couldn't sleep, so we started playing truth or dare. And my little sister dared me to go inside the basement. I didn't want to be a punk, so I did the dare, and I found the key to go to the basement. Before I get down there, I, of course, expected to see bodies. But when I was walking around, I didn't see any. But what was crazy was that it sounded like there were little girls crying. If you want to know what I saw, come back for part two. This is part two of why my dad would never allow me and my sister inside of his basement. So like I said, I went downstairs to the basement and I didn't see any bodies. Instead, I heard whimping and crying. So I went back upstairs and told my sister that there was nothing down there. She said that she wanted to see, so she came to the basement with me. When we were both walking around, she said that she heard the whimpering too. My sister had saw a door and it sounded like the noise was coming from behind the door. When we opened it, we saw girls chained up. This story time is from a follower and she really needs advice. By the way, we're going to call her Jackie. So Jackie has been with her boyfriend Aaron for six years. She always thought that they were going to get married until he cheated on her with her sister. Now, it's been two years and she got over the situation. And then she got an invitation in the mail from her sister for a wedding. She was, of course, happy that to know her sister was about to get married. When she read the name of the groom, it was her ex, Aaron. She was so upset about it, but the rest of her family says it's not that serious. She's debating on going to her own sister's wedding and don't know if she should say something. Comment down below and give this girl some advice. So this is by far the most scariest Halloween experience that I've ever had. Um, I had went out to a Halloween party with one of my friends. Well, two of my friends. We're going to call one Jessica and we're going to call the other one Amina. So Jessica, me and her, we were closer. And Amina, I didn't really know her. I knew her through Jessica because they were friends. So we went out. And at the time, we were eighth graders, okay? Um, we went out and we went to a high school Halloween party. And to us, that's like, ooh, high schoolers, you know. So we went out to go check the party. Um, it cost $2 to get in. It was like a $2 party. We got in. There was candy everywhere. And us being the young boys we were, we was the ones snatching up the candy. When it was time to go, we all left together. On our way home, it was this man following us. So Jessica was the first one to notice that this man was following us. But she told us not to turn around because she didn't want him to notice that we knew that he was behind us. And she just told us to walk faster. And as we walked faster, he got faster. Even after we came from the party, we still went trick-or-treating. He was just still following us. And so my friend Jessica, she picked up a rock and this man was following us for like a good like three minutes, you know. He was making the same turns as us. It was getting suspicious. So my friend Jessica, she threw a rock at him. And then when she threw a rock at him, he started to chase us. Like he literally ran after us. And when I tell you we ran for our lives, we ran for our lives. So we got to Jessica's house. And from there on, I don't know how, but we ended up losing a man. Luckily, but that was just a weird experience. This is why Halloween shouldn't be a thing. We got kids walking around in the middle of the night. Mind you, we was out there till like 10 p.m. Why is y'all still giving us candy at 10 p.m.? That's another thing. Stop celebrating Halloween. Get some candy from the corner store. I'm going to tell y'all straight to my why I quit working at McDonald's after two weeks. And so much happened in those two weeks. Like, it's crazy. I might have to do multiple parts. Hopefully, I don't get sued. And hopefully, you guys like this one. Okay, so the first day I worked there, they literally had me clean everything. And I'm talking about old oil stains on the corner of the floors to clean in the freaking walls and freezers. Which, I was in there for 30 minutes, not to mention. And that was not my job title. 
I was not a freaking janitor. I was a cashier. But come to find out, they only had me cleaning up all that mess because inspection was coming in the next day. And then the older employees proceeded to laugh. One newer employee said she never had to do that. By the way, she came a week before me. They only hired me to clean up all that stuff. I was irritated because no other employee had to do that but me. They wasted my time cleaning freezers and gook off the floor when they could have been training me on the freaking register. I did that for two days, but on the third day, there was a big fight. I gotta make it part two. So if you watched part one already, you already know what they had me doing, the wrong job title purposely. And I did that for two days. On the third day, they finally started to train me on the register. But not really. I wasn't properly trained. That day, it was pretty hectic. I was slow and very confused on the register. And one of the managers asked me how many days I've been there. I said three. And she asked, why are you working so slow on the register? In my head, I thought that she was saying I was a slow worker, in which in reality, now that I think of it, I'm only slow because this is truly my first day because they had me doing other stuff the other first two days. Right before my lunch break, this lady with a knife walks into McDonald's, pointing it at me, asking for one of the managers, claiming she slept with my man. Me, I'm like shook. I don't know which manager she's talking about. I'm pretty new. So I backed up all confused and she come around towards me. Okay, so this is part three of why I stopped working at McDonald's after two weeks. So on my third day of working there, I told you guys about the lady that came with the knife pointing it at me, looking for the manager that slept with her man. When she came around the corner, the same lady that told me that I was working slow was the same lady she was looking for. Now, she had ran to the bag, was trying to hide behind the back door, and people were, some of the employees were trying to stop her, but they wasn't trying to get too close because she had a weapon. The lady is literally waiting on the manager and would not go anywhere until she came back. So one of the employees called the police and they came to get the lady out. When they finally got her out of the building, some of the managers asked, why didn't I stop her? Like, sis, what you want me to do? I wasn't trying to get cut. When I got home, that same manager called later that day and said that my drawer was missing $42. And my first paycheck was $23. I was working there for three days, working eight-hour shifts overtime. And that's a whole nother story on why my paycheck is so low. When I was younger, me and my friend Makai became friends with this new girl who lived in our neighborhood, and we're calling her Valentina. Valentina lived with her brothers, mom, and her dad, who wasn't around often. He came around maybe once a week. One day, we were all playing outside, you know, playing how regular kids should. Valentina's dad pulls up, sits in the car, and watching us as we're playing. When he finally gets out, he waves at Valentina, then calls over my friend Makaya and asks to speak with her. We're all confused, but then he told her that it was very important that she come and that everyone else has to stay here. Makaya and Valentina's dad had walked into the alleyway and turned the corner. And me and Valentina listened and stayed where we're at, and we stopped playing. When Makaya finally comes back, we continue to play. When it was time to go back home, me and Makaya walked home together. I asked her, why did Valentina's dad pull you aside? She proceeded to tell me, he told me not to say, but he asked to see my boobs. There's more to the story, like for part two. So after we go back home and Makaya tells me Valentina's dad asked to see her boobs, I was so in shock. But she tells me she didn't show him because she felt weird doing that. By the way, I forgot to mention, at the time I was 10 and Makaya was 12. She already started developing, if you know what I mean. After she tells me everything that happened, we agreed upon telling her mom. When we got to her house, we told her mom and immediately she calls Makaya's dad. Guys, when I told her dad came to the house, she was ready to kill this man. Her dad was like the hood type, and he brought all his boys. They went to Valentina's house asking to see her dad. Valentina's mom answers, and she tells Makaya's dad that he's not there, which was a lie. I'm guessing she could feel what was about to happen. He then went and told her what her dad had did, and her mom is so in disbelief, and she chooses not to believe him, saying he'd never do that. Makaya's dad was so frustrated and just walked away. As soon as she closes the door, we all hear Valentina's dad say, what's going on? And when I tell you this man ran up, he ran back and kicked the door open. As we hear Valentina's dad, Makaya's dad kicks the door open and he ran inside and just attacked Valentina's dad. It was honestly the most scariest thing I've seen because you could see in his eyes that he was just ready to kill that man. And maybe after a minute, they finally pulled Makaya's dad off of Valentina's dad. And guys, her dad face was just covered in blood. I almost felt bad for him, but then I was like, eh, God's plan. 
Anyways, after the whole thing happened, Valentina's mom called the cops and Micaiah's dad was arrested for assault. But he wasn't in jail for long. Still to this day, he talks about how it was well worth it. And Valentina's father, he was just looked at as a sexual predator. And I never really thought about it until now, but I truly wonder how Valentina felt. Because after the whole situation, me and Micaiah never saw Valentina ever again. Not even on the streets. It was like she disappeared. Hello everyone. This story time is from a follower of mine. She says she liked my story times and wanted to know if I could tell her story time. So here we go. We're calling her Kat because she wanted to stay anonymous. And by the way, she's 17. So last year, Kat was talking to this guy she met through Tinder, which we're calling Mike. Mike seemed like a pretty cool guy and they talked for two months. She followed his Instagram and saw pictures of a baby. She asked who's the child and he told her his little sister. So she didn't think nothing of it. They went out on dates and after six months of talking, they made their relationship official. She would post him, but he never post her. One day, she begged him to post her. And finally, he did, but he deleted it after one hour. Mike told her there were a lot of men liking and commenting on the picture, and he didn't want her to be a sexual object to them. She believed them, thought it was heroic, and just left the whole situation alone. But the next day, she received a message from a girl asking if she was talking to Mike. Kat said yes, and the girl responds that she's his child's mother. This is part two of Kat's story time. After she gets a DM of a girl claiming to be Mike's baby's mother, she immediately texts Mike and asks who she was. Mike responded that she's a family of a friend and that they don't talk no more. He went on about her being crazy for a good hour and why he stays away from her. Kat's still suspicious, so she DMs a girl asking for her number to talk more. Within the first five minutes of talking, she hears a baby crying in the background. She asks who that was and the girl FaceTime her. And remember how Kat saw pictures of a baby on Mike's Instagram page? Well, which he claimed to be his sister? That was the same baby crying in the background of the FaceTime. Kat Hart immediately drops because she wanted to believe what Mike was saying was true, but she had an instant that there was something that he wasn't telling her. Throughout the conversation, Mike's child's mother, she said they were still messing around, and it was around the same time her and Mike was still together. At the end, she broke up with Mike, and she left out with a broken heart. Here's another toxic best friend story time. When I was in middle school, my Instagram page started to grow, and it was only because I used to post a lot of dance videos. My toxic best friend at the time, which we're calling Emily, noticed my page was starting to grow, and she had my Instagram page on her phone, and same thing with her. I had her Instagram page on my phone, but I would never go through her page. When it came to my page, she would notice that I would get a lot of DMs from random guys, you know, sugar daddies, that type of thing, those men that would pay you for your services, if you know what I mean. And this one day, she actually responded back to one of them, and I had no clue until later that day. She was sending naked pictures back, not of me, but random stuff she found on the internet, and one of the dudes she was actually talking to wanted to meet up. And guys, she gave him my address. By the time I checked my phone, they had a whole plan to link up. There's more to the story, like for part two. Part two of my toxic best friend story time. So after I saw that she gave this strange man my address instead of to meet with him, I immediately wrote, hi, I'm a catfish and blocked him. I changed my password so she couldn't get into my Instagram account anymore. And guys, I was so upset that I ran to her house. And usually it takes me 10 minutes to walk to her house, but that day it only took me three. I banged so hard on her door, her mom answered and came out and said, Why are you banging on my door so hard? I said I apologize for banging so hard and that if I could ask to speak to Emily. She tells me she's at her grandma's house, which was only two blocks away. So I went to her grandma's house and this time I knocked, she answered. I immediately yelled, Why the hell would you use my page to tell this man where I live? She tries to gaslight me, which at the time, I didn't know that's what it was. She was basically trying to tell me it wasn't a big deal and that she was going to split half the money with me. I laughed and dragged her down the stairs. There's more to the story, so sorry guys. Like for Part 3 of My Toxic Best Friend so after I met up with Emily to confront her about giving this man my address, she tries to act as though it's not that serious. So after I dragged her down the stairs, and from there we started to get into it. I guess her grandma heard everything from inside because she came running outside to stop it. Once she breaks it up, she asks, why are you two fighting? And that, that's not what sisters are supposed to do. Emily says, I don't know, she just came here and started with me. Her grandma looks at me like, wow, I'm really disappointed in you. Especially because I thought you were one of the good ones around here. My face dropped because Emily never explained truly why I came up here and her grandma was just ready to take her side. I was going to stay quiet and not say nothing because I know her parents are really strict. But you know, I was done protecting her. So I told her grandma everything. 
even things that had nothing to do with the situation. I was so upset. But after the whole situation was over, I didn't talk to her for almost a year. Then that next summer, I don't know. We just Around this time in October, a couple years ago when I was in 7th grade, I went to a friend's house for a slumber party and we're calling her Charlotte. It was Charlotte's birthday party and she had a big sleepover with 10 other girls. I knew 6 of them because they were friends and they lived in our neighborhood. The other 4 were her cousins and a friend from school. She had ice cream and cake, we danced, prank call, you know the regular preteen sleepover. Later that night, we watched a scary movie and after it was over, one of Charlotte's friends from school said we should play the Ouija board. By the way, we're calling her Sam. I wasn't really into it because my mom always told me to stay away from those things. Charlotte wanted to play too and she said, how are we going to play without the board? Sam said, we can make one. All we need is cardboard. Somehow they found cardboard in the kitchen and Sam made the board and a triangle piece with a hole in it. I was like, that's not going to work. When Sam and Charlotte played, the piece moved across the board. When the piece moved, everyone screamed, and Charlotte's dad came in the room asking what the problem was. Charlotte immediately scooted the board under the bed and said, I thought I saw a bug, but it was just a hairball. And her dad seemed a little irritated, but he just walked out the room. When he left, Sam pulled the board back from under the bed, saying that the game needed to be finished, but Charlotte said she still wanted to ask questions. So everyone each got to ask a question, and the board answered it. They even asked questions of today, and at the time, our president was Obama, and it knew who the president was. When it was Sam's turn, she asked jokingly, since the board knew everything, she asked when we were going to die, and it said, tonight. And from there on, everyone stopped playing. Charlotte got scared and didn't even want to touch the board anymore. Sam constantly said that we all have to say goodbye, but everyone wanted to stay away. And usually when you don't say goodbye, the spirits that you talk through, through the board, continue to roam around your home. This story time is from a follower, and she said she liked to be called Desiree. So last year, Desiree was starting college, and she lived in a dorm room. She went to school for communications, and she liked everything about it, including a new friend she made. One of the new friends she created was a guy, and his name was Jalen, and she was really starting to like him. They met in math class, and from there, they became friends. Jalen was low-key hinting that he liked her also. He did nice things for her, like help her with schoolwork, buy her lunch, and was just an all-around good person to vent to. A couple days before winter break, Cassidy was finally ready to tell Jalen how she felt about him. So that day, they had plans to go out as usual. They ended up going to the mall, got food, and for the first time, they went to Cassidy's dorm room. They turned on a movie. They both fell asleep in the middle of the movie. A couple minutes later, Cassidy woke up and her leg was wet. When she stood up, come to find it, Jalen peed in her bed. Today's story time is from a follower and she needs advice. I didn't want to tell this one because it seemed kind of personal, but it'll probably help other girls who are going through the same issues. Hopefully TikTok doesn't take down this video. By the way, we're calling her Brandy and she's 15. So growing up, Brandy lived with her mom and her dad and occasionally she would be with her grandparents whenever her parents were arguing for a long period of time. She practically grew up with her grandparents. She even had her own room. But whenever she come back home, she would notice her mom wearing sweaters and chokers. It was this one summer where all she wore was jackets. She said her mom claimed to be cold. Anyways, earlier this year for Mother's Day, Brandy wanted to surprise her mom. So she bought gifts from the store, came into the house quietly, and busted into her room to surprise her. When she came in, her mom was half naked, and she had a lot of bruises on her neck, arms, just about everywhere but her face. There's more to the story. Part 2 will be up soon. So when Brandy busted into her room, she noticed her mom had a lot of bruises on her body. Her mom quickly covers up and tells her to hold on. Brandy asked her if she was okay and did someone do something. Her mom said no. So she ran downstairs and she asked her dad why did her mom have so many bruises. Her dad said she fell down the stairs and that she's okay. She was a bit confused, so she went back upstairs to her mom's room and asked her why she had so many bruises. Her mom began to say, oh, they're not bruises. It was just an allergic reaction to something I ate, and now I have rashes on my body. Brandy then gives her mom the gifts and was still confused because her dad told a whole different story. But she left the situation alone, and after that, the past months, every time she would get back home from her grandparents, she would notice the bruises were getting worse, and now she's assuming that her dad is abusing her mom, and she doesn't know what to do or say because she's never seen her dad as a violent person. But please comment down below some advice. This story time is from a follower on why she regrets getting breast implants. She had breast implants and then she had to get them removed and now she has no left breast at all. She would never grow because she's been an A cup since 7th grade and she said she wasn't ever insecure about them. It was just something she wanted for herself. So she saved up to get the procedure done and she went to her appointment and then finally got her implants put in. 
The doctor told her it would take six to eight weeks to heal and three months for everything to sit in place and she'd be all right. So she expected the soreness and tenderness, but even at the three months, her breasts were still in pain. And at four months, the pain was going away, but she couldn't feel either of her breasts. And she noticed her left breast had turned completely black, and that's not even the worst part, life of part two. This is part two of why Chloe regrets getting breast implants. Like I said earlier, Chloe got her breast implants done and she couldn't feel either of them and her left breast had turned completely black. It didn't happen in one day. She saw a discoloration at first, but then it gradually turned black. Also, those four months, she felt fatigue, nauseous, sick all the time. After seeing what was happening to her breasts, she went to the emergency room and they had planned to take them out. The implants were black. She was told it was because fungus had made its way into her bloodstreams. They ended up taking both of her implants out and her left breast she had to get completely removed because the tissue was dying and now her breast is more deflated than before she got the implants. End of the story, she don't think everyone's body is made for these type of surgeries and she wished she was told this that this could be a complication before even getting them. This story times how I caught my boyfriend cheating on me with my best friend. Okay, so my birthday is when I introduced my two favorite people in the world, my boyfriend and my old childhood best friend. We went out to the club along with some other friends. We all had a great time and they were also able to talk, which I was glad about because they'd be able to be comfortable around each other so it wouldn't be awkward. After the night was over, my boyfriend asked if they could exchange contacts and I was filled with liquid courage and thought it was cool because then they would be close. I don't know. But fast forward a couple months, I went on a business trip for a week to Florida, but the trip cut short because I got finished doing everything and was able to come home two days early. So I wanted to surprise my boyfriend and I bought some food from his favorite restaurants. When I got home, I called for my boyfriend, but no response. Then I went upstairs and heard moaning in my bedroom. So I bust in and saw my boyfriend laying in bed with my best friend. If y'all want to know what happened after that, let me know down below in the comments. This is part two of how I caught my boyfriend cheating on me with my best friend. So after I came back home two days early from my business trip, I caught my boyfriend in bed with my best friend. And my heart has never burned so hard. I blacked out and I went crazy. I jumped on the bed and started beating him. And he was stronger than me and was able to pin me down. He was naked, but he was over me, so I was able to squeeze his you-know-what. And he crawled in the corner, panicking. My best friend seemed like she was trying to put on clothes and rush out, but she wasn't getting away easy. So I snatched the clothes she was trying to put on, threw it out the window, I snatched her up by the hair, dragged her out of the house, and she stood outside naked. And I didn't care because I never felt so betrayed. Then I went back to the room, and it seemed like my boyfriend was trying to get up and put on clothes and grab his keys. But I snatched the keys out of his hands and flushed them down the toilet. At that point, I got fed up. So I grabbed my taser and told him to get out, and I left both of them outside naked. My boyfriend was trying to get back in the house, so I called the police about trespassers trying to get inside my house and trying to attack me. If you want to know what happened after that, let me know down below in the comments. This is part three of how I caught my boyfriend cheating on me with my best friend. So after I caught them in bed together, I kicked them out of the house completely naked. When my boyfriend was trying to get back in, I called the police about trespassers trying to get inside my house and attacking me. And it was my house. I paid the bills. His name wasn't on the deed, and they were both arrested. My boyfriend even tried to run and hide, but they tackled him and pinned him down. And you know, it felt good to see, but I was still hurt. And the crazy thing is, three years later, they are now together. My ex-best friend even got pregnant. She tried to invite me to the baby shower, but I threw the invitation away. Instead, I sent them a cute bag of dirty diapers. This story time is why I stopped being friends with the girl because her dad was a pervert and we're calling her Kim. So me and Kim became friends at school. Over time, we realized we lived close together. So she started coming over to my house and I started going over to hers. She had five brothers and she was the only girl. 
Whenever I'd come over to her house, I'd say hello to everyone, but her dad was always excited to see me. He'd immediately run and give me a hug. Over the past couple months, he'd give me a hug and a kiss on the cheek. He said that I was his new little girl. I felt uncomfortable with it, but I went and told my friend Kim, and she said, he's just glad you're here, and you're like family now. I was like, okay, I guess, and I would just ignore it. Thanksgiving come up, and I went over to her house for a plate. Her dad opened up the door and gave me a hug and a kiss, as usual. I walked in the house, and he said, you need to eat to keep that booty plump. I laughed in nervousness. He slapped and squeezed my butt. There's more that happened after this. Let me know if you guys want a part two. This is part two of why I stopped being friends with the girl because her dad was a pervert. So remember how I told y'all I came over for Thanksgiving? Her dad slapped and squeezed my butt. I was weirded out, but I laughed to hide how nervous and anxious I was. After I get a plate of food and I sit down with Kim, I told her her dad slapped my butt. And she was like, yeah, okay, as if she didn't believe me. So again, I ignored the situation. As the day goes on, everyone is playing board games, laughing, and eating desserts. I had cheesecake, and I'm lactose intolerant, and you know how that went. I left the family for a few minutes, and I go to the bathroom. When I was all finished, I opened up the door, and there was Kim's dad just sitting there smiling at me. I was like, oops, my bad. You were probably waiting for a while. Here you go. And I tried to move out of the way, but then he says, I don't need to go to the bathroom. He pushes me back in by the hips and locks the door. It gets really bad after this. Y'all let me know if I should make a part three. This is part three of why I stopped being friends with the girl because her dad was a pervert. So after her dad pushes me back into the bathroom and locks the door, he's sitting there smiling at me and I asked him very nervously if I did something wrong. He was like, yes, you haven't been spending time with daddy and he likes to jiggle my breasts in a weird way. At this point, I was backing up because he starts acting weird. Then he starts unzipping his pants and gets closer to me. And guys, their bathroom wasn't that big. I immediately took the Windex that was on top of their toilet and sprayed it into his eyes and quickly ran out of the bathroom. After this, her dad starts yelling. While I'm coming downstairs, everyone asks what's going on. I told the whole family what Kim dad has done and one of their little brothers yells at me calling me a whore. I then went to Kim saying, you gotta believe me, that's what happened. She's like, my dad would never do anything like that. Her mom walks up to me and tells me that I should leave. I start crying and then her mom yells at me and tells me to go home. So I left and went home crying. After that, I never went back over to her house.